I'm going to start um, by just saying a few words about um, the organisation I work for, Creativity, Culture and Education. Um, we're a non-governmental organisation. Um, we have our headquarters in Newcastle, in the north of England. Uh, we have an office in London as well, and we operate through a network of uh, teams that we have all over England and are beginning to establish elsewhere. The major program that we run is called Creative Partnerships. And Creative Partnerships puts creative professionals, artists, designers, architects, and so forth, into schools in England in long-term relationships. They don't work all day every week, but they will go to a school regularly for a year, for two years, or for three years. And at any one time, we have about two and a half thousand schools in England in our programs, which is about 10% of all schools um, in England. And we'll be working with around 300,000 young people. The program is very much focused on unlocking creativity in young people. Um, but through the success that we've had with that program, we've begun to develop other programs as well. We're particularly now working in other places in Europe. The Artists in Creative Education program is a partnership program with Austria, Holland and Sweden, in which we're looking at how artists should be trained to work in primary schools. Uh, we're also advisors now to the city of Amsterdam on their creative and cultural programs. And we're working in places like Latvia and Lithuania and in Germany, devising uh, programs modeled on creative partnerships that we can roll out uh, across those countries as well. So the first um, question really is why do we do this? I was visiting a school the other day um, that we work with, a secondary school in the north of England. And after I had seen some of the projects I'd been taken uh, there to see, um, I was asked if I would give an interview to a 16-year-old boy who um, was uh, doing a project about creative partnerships and wanted to know um, a bit more about it. So I went into the head teacher's office, the school director, and uh, he was the boy who was sitting there, and he had his video camera set up, and I sat down in a chair, and he asked me uh, some questions about creative partnerships. And I said, thank you very much, and I went away. Well, four days later, no, sorry, four weeks later, um, I got in the post a DVD. And this is our technical problem, uh, which is that we can't make the sound work on our laptop. Um, but what you can imagine as you watch this um, is that it's my voice talking about creative partnerships, but this is how he's uh, edited it. <laughs> Now, the significant thing about um, that video is that a few weeks later, I was in London having a meeting with the chief executives of some of our biggest advertising agencies. 
And advertising agencies are a very big generator of employment in the United Kingdom. Uh, we have a lot of very big ones. Uh, they don't just operate uh, in the UK, but they operate internationally. And a lot of people want to work in advertising. They're very interested in working in advertising. But um, we were having a conversation talking about how young people from poorer backgrounds and from uh, not in London could get jobs in the advertising uh, industry. And the chief executives were saying that this is very, very difficult. Whenever we advertise an entry-level job, even just a receptionist, something like that, in uh, an advertising agency. We get 1,000, 2,000 applications. You, know, you need a good degree, you probably need a PhD, even to be considered for an interview. And a lot of people now um, do internships, unpaid internships. So they apply to work for no pay, for a year or sometimes two years in advertising agency in order to build up a resume with experience of working in the advertising industry. And obviously, it's only people from a much more affluent background who can afford to work for no pay in order to build up a resume um, with the right experience. So they were saying, you know, if you don't live in London, if your parents aren't rich, and so on and so forth, uh, it's really difficult to get into the advertising agency or the advertising industry. But at the end, I said, can I just show you something? And I showed them that video. Now that boy, 16 years old, in a secondary school in the north of England, in a very deprived area, they all saw that video and they wanted the telephone number of the boy because they were going to give him a job there and then because that kind of talent you absolutely recognize um, and you need because they could see that by the end of the week, they could be doing presentations to clients with ideas based on the kind of quality of ideas and quality of execution that that boy was doing. And this reflects how fundamentally different uh, the economy of the 21st century is now. It's no longer about training for a profession. So you think, this is what I want to do. I go to school and university and I study it and then I know how to do it, and then I can get the job. According to statistics by the British government, and I don't know how they work out statistics like this, but they argue that 60% of all the jobs that young people in school today will do have not yet been invented. So they turn up to school, and you're training them for jobs you cannot imagine, and they cannot imagine. And more important that, than that, they're going to have to invent those jobs for themselves. And what the world is looking for now is job creators and not job seekers. And that's a huge change. And the question then is, how do you train young people to be prepared to create their job when they leave school and university, as opposed to simply take a job that they're offered. Um, I was talking to uh, a young man in Lithuania the other day, he's 26, 27, and I said to him, what business do you do? And he said, oh, I've got various businesses. And I said, well, give me an example.